Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 John, chapter 1. And we'll begin our reading at verse 1. 1 John, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the Word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. The Lord bless in the reading of His Word. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 20. Disappointment and heartache are not easy to bear, especially when so much depends on it. The one they revered, the one they believed, the one they, they trusted, the one they had hoped in, is dead. It was over. The hopes are dashed, grief, disillusionment, despair have settled in perhaps for the rest of their lives. They have assembled in an upper room on Saturday. They have gathered together from their dispersal and fear from the Garden of Gethsemane. John and Peter had lingered to see the end. He was dead. There was no doubt about it. No one could survive what the Romans did to those they executed. As they assembled that Saturday, you can imagine some of the discussion as they thought about how, how could they possibly have been wrong? There was, there was so much that was, was certain. We saw the, the blameless life that they, Jesus himself said to his enemies, which of you convicts me of sin? There was, there was not a single word, thought, or deed this man had ever done. He was blameless. And then, of course, from our 20th century, 21st century perspective, there's the, the, the miracles. We in the West like to see hard and fast evidence, and there were, there were things done that these men saw that the multitude saw a great deal, but these guys saw all kinds of things. They saw him still the storm, which frightened them far more than the storm did itself. They saw him turn water to wine. They saw him walking on the water. They saw him feed the multitudes twice. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him give blind the, or sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf cleansing the lepers, all sorts of things. And they saw this day in and day out for three and a half years. The enemies of, of Christ saw these things happen right before their eyes, and that was one of the reasons they persecuted him. Their perception was that he had somehow, by the power of God, broken the Sabbath. This man had the right pedigree. He was of the lineage of David. That's why we have that genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. If his enemies could have disproved his, his pedigree, they would have done so. They had access to the temple records. It was the right time, according to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. They had all these things. And this was the king. And they were anticipating the arrival of the kingdom. As we saw last week with the triumphal entry. Hosanna, save us now. That was the expectation, not only of the crowds, but of the disciples. They had argued among themselves which of them would be the greatest. They had argued this even at the Last Supper. Who's going to be the Secretary of State? Who's going to be the Prime Minister? Who's going to be doing all these responsibilities in the kingdom? Who's gonna, what's going to be the pecking order? Who's going to be the, the greatest among us? That was their expectation. And yet, over the last year, perhaps a little bit more, 
At least three times that we have recorded in the Gospels, Jesus had told his disciples that he would be betrayed, that he would be killed, and that he would rise again the third day. And, and it went in one ear and out the other. They were told. And yet they, they didn't seem to, to pay much attention to that. They were so engrossed in, their, in themselves and in their own greatness, in their place in the kingdom, that they failed to understand the message that they themselves had preached earlier, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance. Why is there a need for repentance? Because the problem is sin. The problem is, is man's rebellion against God. There needs to be a reconciliation. There needs to be a reconciliation so that man can be right with God. There needs to be a reconciliation in order for the kingdom to come. That was the condition. And yet so few believed and even fewer understood. We have no record that anybody prior to the resurrection understood. The master was dead. Many of his followers had seen him die. There's no doubt. Two days have passed. The grief and the disappointment are as fresh as they were on that dark Friday afternoon. And they are confused. Had they been wrong? Had we misunderstood? And the answer is, no, they hadn't been wrong, but yes, they had misunderstood. The truth would change their lives and shake the world, but first, they must believe the truth. Now, we, we sometimes think, some of the arguments for those who would debunk the whole idea of the resurrection are, are turned upside down when we look at the disciples. And everybody that was a follower of Jesus, it isn't just the 12, it's everybody around them. Early in the morning, the first day of the week, let's look at verse 1 of chapter 20. Cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre. The ladies had come. There would be more that would follow. That's not all recorded in this gospel, but if you were to piece it together the other gospels, you can find out there were several waves of these people that came to the tomb. And they came to prepare the body for burial. It had been a hasty burial. The Sabbath, the Passover. And so they came to prepare the body. They did not expect to find anything but a dead body. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who had placed him in the tomb in the first place, had done so with the spices and the, and the, the linen cloth, as was typical for a Jewish burial at that time. They did not anticipate anything but a burial. They, too were perhaps disillusioned, discouraged, disappointed. Their own people had demanded the, the death of Jesus. The Romans had been more than happy to accommodate them. And Jesus had died. And yet Jesus had said all this was going to happen. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, it says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples, by the way, this indicates that there were many times besides the three that are recorded, how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And so for a period of months he had, had told them this. And other than Peter's brief rebuke, for which he was rebuked, there doesn't seem to be any questioning by the disciples. What do you mean by this? Why is this necessary? Does it have to be? What's going on here? What are we misunderstanding? There's no explanation. At least not that we have recorded. This is not what they anticipated. The king is supposed to rule and reign in glory. As you look at the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, the majority of them, at least four-fifths of them, deal with Messiah in his glory. And because that's the case, that's the, the good things, that's what we like to emphasize, that's what we want to look at, that's what we want to anticipate, and that was the mindset of the Jews of that day, those who were looking. The Messiah is going to come, he will restore the throne of David, Israel will now be the, the pinnacle of world focus and world domination, and the nations will come and pay homage to us. They will pay tribute to us, they will come and kneel before our king. 
And of course, as we anticipate that, that'd be the kind of thing that you want to emphasize. The very idea that we have these, these perplexing passages that teach something different, we don't, want to, we don't want to focus on those. We want to focus on the, on the glory. Messiah is supposed to come and conquer his enemies. They did not consider the Old Testament prophecies that Messiah should also suffer. Let's look at two of those. One is Isaiah chapter 53. The whole chapter deals with this. We'll start in verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's the irony of the whole thing. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He, the Father, shall see of the travail of his soul, the Son, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities." A passage we know, a passage we've heard many times, we, it's part of Handel's Messiah. And yet the folks there in the first century knew it too and chose to overlook the implications of it. Psalm 22, verses 14 and 15. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. It was promised in the Old Testament. That last one was written a thousand years before the crucifixion. The other one, 700 years plus. They should have known. They were told by Messiah, it's there in the scripture. And now he is dead. The master, the king of Israel, the promised Messiah. And they're disillusioned, they're disappointed. They're wondering what in the world has happened. All their expectations have been dashed. What had I misunderstood? There were the miracles, the preaching, the teaching, the blameless life, the fulfillment of prophecy. So many regarding his first coming. He was of the right pedigree. This had to be the one. This is the one. Even Nicodemus, early in the ministry of Jesus, came to him and said, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that you do except God be with him. It's interesting. You go through your Old Testament, you'll not see anybody receive their sight. But Jesus did it countless times. Over and over again. Miracles untold, much more than the Old Testament. All, all the Old Testament combined even. And what now? Our plans, our expectations have been overturned. Now put yourself in the shoes of these disciples. This is their thinking. They're in terror of the, of the mob, of the masses. These same people have crucified their master. What's going to happen to them? They are hiding in the upper room. It says, for fear of the Jews. If they were found out, they might be dragged off and, and stoned to death, or perhaps turned over to the Roman uh, officials as accomplices of some kind of an insurrection. They're terrified, they're discouraged, they're disillusioned. What am I to do? What am I to think? I dare say that a great many people have, even in their Christian faith, perhaps even especially in their Christian faith, have, have run into that same thing. I've experienced something, I've heard something that is, has turned my, my faith into doubt. I heard something, I heard these convincing arguments, maybe I went to college, maybe I, I, I heard this in a, in a lecture hall, maybe I heard something on the radio, maybe I read a book, but my faith has been, been in great turmoil since that time. Now, by the way, if you're wrestling with that, you need to recognize 
a couple of th several things. Number one is you're putting more faith in the person that told you something than in what God has said in His Word. And also, the realm of science, or so often falsely so called, is constantly adjusting and in turmoil. What is true today was not true yesterday. What was dogma when I was growing up is not dogma today. What was certainty day before yesterday is, is a lie tomorrow. Which means, for considering when they, how much they, they say they know, there's very little that they actually do know. And yet we have God's word before us. We've had this for almost 2,000 years, and we haven't had to make any adjustments. Why? Because God is the author. God got it right the first time. He doesn't have to say, oh, let me, let me fix this. Let me adjust this. Oh, let me, I, I learned something new the other day. I need to erase this and pencil this in. It doesn't work that way for God's Word. Yes, the Scripture is right the first time. And so what am I to do? What am I to think? The supposed facts are against me. And I, I choose to forget that Jesus said that he would be betrayed, that he would be killed, that he would rise again the third day. Now perhaps they're saying, that doesn't happen! And yet these guys here were eyewitnesses to at least two occasions where someone was brought back from the dead. One from a, a funeral pier and the other one out of the grave where he'd been for several days. And now they hear some, some early reports. She seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. She runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That would be John. And saith unto him, They have taken the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. And so they ran to the sepulcher, and they look, and they see the clothes lying there, the napkin to the side folded up. If someone were to steal the body, why would that still be there? They would wrap up the, the body like a mummy. Why unwrap the body before taking it away if it was stolen? Some of this is just not making sense. Why? Why? And, and he's not there. It says that when John saw he believed. Perhaps he remembered what Jesus had said. But Peter wondered, what happened? Could, as they probably talked with one another on their way back to the city, could it, could it possibly be? What has happened? Mary Magdalene had been to the tomb and actually saw Jesus alive and talked to him. Thought he was the gardener. And she came back and she told the disciples. And it says in Mark chapter 16 and verse 7, And when they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, they believed not. They believed not. Now, a lot of the naysayers will say, well, the disciples, they were so eager to believe. They wanted to believe. They just couldn't fathom the idea that Jesus had died, and so they came up with a conspiracy. No, no, these fellows here didn't believe. They had to be convinced. They had to be convinced. There's not a person in this room that who has trusted Jesus Christ who has seen him. And yet these men had walked with him, talked with him, saw him, saw all the things that he did, and heard him say, I will be killed and I will rise again the third day. They have the scripture. They have everything we have. And they still would not believe. And then they have eyewitnesses. I, the tomb is empty. They went and saw it. They saw the tomb empty. And they're scratching their heads wondering what in the world has happened. Mary Magdalene sees the resurrected Christ, runs back and tells, tells the disciples, and they just like, just, just, just go away. We're heartbroken. Don't be telling us these, these fairy tales. One of my favorite passages in the New Testament is Luke chapter 2, verses 13 through 35. Now remember, there were a great many disciples of Jesus. We have the 12 apostles. 
But there were a great many disciples. And two of them were on the road to Emmaus. It's about six, a little over six miles uh, east of Jerusalem. It was a long walk. And they talked, with the, talked between themselves. They are sad, it says. And as they talked, they're discussing the events of the, the last three days. How Jesus had come in in great triumph, in great praise, Hosanna to the Son of David. But the leadership had rejected him and had encouraged the crowd and stirred them up. And they called for Jesus' crucifixion. He had been arrested. By the way, when it says, uh, if you look, up, look this up, do a little study. There were about 600 people that came to arrest Jesus in Gethsemane. It was a big crowd. And it was in the middle of the night. There's no street lights. Perhaps there are torches, perhaps a few lamps. But they want to make sure that they get the right man and they want to make sure that there's no escape and they want to make sure that they have more than enough to be able to deal with his disciples if necessary. Jesus has been arrested. He was tried illegally. He was brought before the Roman governor because the Jews legally could not execute him. And the Romans, to accommodate the Jews, executed him. As these two are walking on the road to Emmaus, having experienced all these things, perhaps very likely being firsthand eyewitnesses to a number of these things, they're walking and they're sad. And it says that they had hoped that this had been he, that this would be the one. This was what their, their hope, their expectation was there. But now that he's, that he's died, maybe they, were, maybe they were mistaken. I mean, he saw these, they saw these things. They, they had all the evidences that the others had. They were disciples. And yet the outcome is so different from what they had anticipated that perhaps, perhaps they'd been wrong. A long walk, talking amongst themselves, and then a, a third man comes up and joins the, the party as they walk to Emmaus. They had walked a number of miles together. This third one said, well, I'm, I'm going on. They said, no, 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 it's late in the day. You, you stop and have dinner with us. Well, okay. And he sits down to the meal with them and he blesses the food and their eyes were opened and they see that it's the Lord. And then he disappears. He vanishes. And they looked at one another and they said, did not our, our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us? Because this, this third man, Jesus, had shown them from the Old Testament that it was necessary that Messiah die. That it was necessary for him to make atonement for mankind. That the shedding of blood was necessary for the payment of salvation. And not only that, the Messiah would also rise from the dead. And when they found out who it was, here it is, dinner time, dinner hour. They got up and they probably ran as much as they could all the way back to Jerusalem, six, seven miles, to tell the disciples what they had seen and heard. And they get back to, they get back to Jerusalem. They get back to that upper room, probably whispering a secret password so they can get in to see these guys who are terrified. And they say, we've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord, and this is what he said to us, and this is, this is how we knew it was him. And, and it says in, in Mark chapter 16 and verse 13, that neither believed they them. We have Mary Magdalene. We have some of the other ladies that had come earlier. We have these two from the road, of, the road to Emmaus. And it says that neither believed they them. And all this is going on, and you can imagine the heated discussion. Yeah, don't tell me. I know what you're saying. I know what you think you saw, but he's dead. I'm telling you, he's dead. We saw him dead. And while this discussion is going on, while this debate is going on in that upper room, in Luke chapter 16, verses 36 through 43, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. <laughs> and it says... And they were terrified and affrighted. And suppose that he had 
that they had seen a spirit. That word spirit there is the word we get our word phantom from. They thought it was a ghost. It can't be him. It can't be him. I know we've, we've been arguing with two guys that insisted that they had seen him and eaten with him and talked with him. But it can't be. It, it just can't be. I will not believe. And that here he is. And initially, they don't, they don't accept it for what it is. I'm seeing something. It's a ghost. And they were scared out of their minds. It says they were terrified and affrighted. And he said unto them, why, why are you troubled? And why do these, why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Look at the scars, the marks of the nails. Handle me and see. Feel, I'm, I'm, I'm not a ghost. I'm a physical, tangible being. Feel me, touch me, handle my hands, look at my feet. And when they had, he had spoken, he showed unto them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy, they just, it's beginning to sink in. It's beginning to sink in that this is, this is real. This is real. And they wondered. He said unto them, by, by the way, you got, you got something to eat. Do you have any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a, and a piece of honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. Why did he do that? Was he hungry? What's the point? That a physical, I'm a physical being, I, I'm eating something. You are watching me, you're seeing, you're touching me, you're looking at the, the wounds from the crucifixion, you're watching me eat something, yes, I'm alive, it is me, it's not a ghost, it's really me. Now, as you read through this, look in verse, uh, verse 24, it says, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So when this debate is going on in the upper room, Thomas is not there. Perhaps running an errand, perhaps who knows what he, what he was doing, but he wasn't there when this happened. Jesus was probably there with them for 15, 20 minutes, maybe a half an hour, we're not sure. But for whatever reason, Thomas was not there. When he shows up, Jesus is gone. And when he shows up, he gets the same report from the ten, because it's minus Thomas and minus Judas Iscariot. He gets the report from the ten that they had heard from the ladies and from these, these two fellows that had been on the road to Emmaus. And you can imagine him not going, wow, it must be real. No, he's rolling his eyes and saying, oh, not you guys too. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. And he said unto them, and you can see him wagging his finger. He said unto them, except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, into that spear wound from the, the soldier's spear, and then thrust my hand into his side, he says, I will not believe. I don't care what you guys say, I am not going to believe. You know, as we... We share the gospel with people. Maybe people that knew us before we came to know Christ as Savior. They knew what we were like. And then God has saved us. We have put our faith and trust in Christ. And God has transformed our lives. And, and we are very different from what we were. And maybe you've had this experience. And somebody starts talking and says, man, what, what in the world happened to you? I used to see you over here and we'd do this. I haven't seen you. What in the world happened to you? And you tell them the story. And they're, they're pulling a Thomas. The eyes roll back into their head and they'll go, great. Great. And you tell them what, what Christ did for you. How he has transformed your life. That, it was, that it, it was like flipping on a switch. All of a sudden you saw, all of a sudden you understood. And, and God changed your life. Your, your desire, your appetite, everything about you changed. And they're seeing it in you. Because they're saying, what happened to you? And you tell them. And they're incredulous. Oh, you got religion. Oh. But what was it that changed your life? I don't have the power in and of myself to, to transform myself. 
We, we, we make a mockery every year about New Year's resolutions because no one keeps them. And yet when God saves me, I am changed because it is God who works in us both to do and to will of his good play. God is the one who changes us. I'm not changing myself. God is changing me. And there has to be an answer for that. Ah, they don't want to hear it. Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, put my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. And from Thomas's perspective, perhaps we might have a little sympathy. I will not be, I will not be fooled. I will not embrace wishful thinking. My heart has been broken. I am, I am rethinking everything of the last three and a half years. I am still trying to wrap my head around this. And don't be telling me that this, this whole thing about his death is not so. I saw him dying. Don't tell me he's come back to life. People don't come back to life. <laughs> Even though he had seen people come back to life two times before. I will not, I will not have my heart broken again. This is the, in a back doorway, this is often the argument of people who say, well, I'm, I, don't wanna, I don't want your religion because it's full of hypocrites. Yes, yes, there are hypocrites. But Jesus is not a hypocrite. If you are looking at people, people will always disappoint, people will always fail. I don't care who it is. But Jesus never fails. And I have been told time and again as I share the gospel, I say, you can have everlasting life. Jesus did this for you. Yes, I believe that. Yes, I accept that. Yes, I... Well, why don't you trust Christ? Well, let me tell you what happened to me when I was eight years old. And they'll tell me some horror story about a Sunday school teacher or somebody that, that offended them at church when they were young. And so I don't want any of this. Well, you're, you're, you're looking at somebody who very likely was attending church but wasn't a believer. Or perhaps you're only remembering what you want to remember. Or, you know what? Christians aren't perfect either. And we say and do things that we're ashamed of. There's lots of things that I regret. Oh, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Ah! Oh! But Jesus never did that. He's always faithful. He's always true. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He always speaks the truth. He is enough. He is sufficient. His grace is all I need. But I don't want my heart broken again. If you put it in the right place, if you put your faith and trust in the right thing, it won't be. And so we continue on in John chapter 20, verses 26 through 29. Eight days go by. Eight days go by. And again, the disciples were within. And this time Thomas is there. Now you can imagine, for over a week, these guys have been trying to convince Thomas that Jesus has risen from the dead. And they've heard the, he's heard the ladies, and he's heard the two from, from Emmaus. And as we look other places in the scripture, there were other, other times, other places, where people saw the Lord. And he's getting inundated with all this information, all this testimony of the resurrection. He's like, I don't want to hear it. I told you, I've got to see it with my own eyes. After eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus. The doors being shut. Now, here's an interesting thing. Jesus has, to this day, the tomb was empty. The body we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The body was transformed, still physical. And yet there are, are traits and characteristics of the, of the resurrection body that we don't have in this one. For one thing, we know from other places in the scripture, it's free from, from pain. I'll take that. I'll take that. It doesn't grow old. It doesn't get sick. It is sin-free. And we see that somehow or another, Jesus was able to appear in a locked room, still in a physical form, without opening the door. 
I had a professor in college that explained it this way. He says, now he says I'm not telling you this is the answer, but this is kind of an interesting thought. A mo a, a, an atom is almost all empty space. You've got the, the nucleus with the, the protons and the neutrons, and I think they've discovered a few other things that they think are in there. And then you've got the, the whirling electrons around the outside. And yet an atom is almost all open space. If you think of our solar system, it's a very similar type of concept. It's mostly open space. So if, it, if it's mostly open space, why can't I just sort of fit between? Why can't I slide one hand through the other? Well, it's because I'm all mixed up. They're whirling around so fast that the, and, and, the, and the, the electrical forces, the positive and neutron, the electrical, it doesn't allow for it to happen. Can you imagine being able to align your, your, your molecules in such a way that you just slide through? However it was done, it was done. He comes into the room. The door is being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. By the way, that was a standard Jewish greeting. Then he said to Thomas, turns right to Thomas, knowing everything that has gone on, and said, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither your hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now, by the way, the whole idea of, of Thomas rolling his eyes and standing back on one leg with his arms folded and saying, going, Really? His reaction is very different this time. It's very different. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen, thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. His confession of my Lord and my God is a confession of Jesus' identity and a confession of his, his deity. And then we get to the end of this, this chapter, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. It says, And many other signs, truly, did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in, the book, in this book. We do not have in the gospel accounts a complete record of all the th amazing things that Jesus did. But why do we have what we have? But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. I will not believe. They believe not. And then seeing with their eyes, we go back to the passage we read earlier this morning in 1 John chapter, chapter 1. That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. When we read the, the testimony, the eyewitness accounts of the, the apostles, we are talking about men that were convinced against their will. Men that had to more than see to believe. They had to hear and handle and listen to the arguments from the Lord himself. Sit down and eat meals with him. Having seen him die before the, the eyes of thousands. And yet we have a record in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that over 500 people saw the resurrected Christ. That's a lot of testimony. That's a lot of eyewitnesses. He says here, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you believing you might have life through his name. The Gospel of John was one of the last books of the New Testament written. This was written perhaps 65 or maybe even 70 years after the events that are recorded. Almost everybody that is mentioned in here. John was an old, old guy when he wrote this. All the other apostles are gone. Probably everybody else that's mentioned in this book is gone. And yet the gospel is still being preached. And people are still believing. 
The Holy Spirit opens our eyes, our understanding, and we put our faith, our trust in this, but we're also accepting as fact the testimony of those who were there. They saw, they heard, they handled. And it wasn't until they saw and heard and handled that they believed. And yet our Lord said, Blessed are those that have not seen and yet have believed. On what testimony then do I hear? Well, I have the record that's here that God has given us in his book. What else do I have? I can, and many in this room could do the same. We could share our, our own testimony. As I mentioned earlier, that when I put my faith and trust in Christ, I went to Sunday school as a kid, and I, I heard the gospels, I heard the Bible stories, and, I, and I, I, I was told these different things, but I didn't understand how it all worked. And reading a gospel tract on a, on a, that was left on a table in a waiting room by myself where I was left for about 45 minutes, I picked this thing up, and that little tract put the pieces together for me. And leaning against the wall next to a payphone, that'll let you know how long ago it was, I put my trust in Christ. God, the Holy Spirit, opened my understanding of what God's Word says. Because taken in a plain sense, this is what the book says. I know people have pulled it to pieces and, and picked out and cherry-picked the, cherry the things they want to have you say and have you believe. But if you read the book, this is the gospel. The good news is that Jesus Christ bore our sins. By putting our faith, our trust in him, that's how we get salvation. It isn't by baptism, church membership, or anything else. And it's a simple gospel. And people all over the world, language, culture, transcends it all, can tell their story of how God saved them and transformed their lives. What's our faith then? It's all in the same thing. All around the world, Christ bore my sins. He was buried and rose again. And by putting my trust in what Christ did for me, I can have everlasting life. It isn't what I do. It's what Christ has done for me. Do you know where you'll spend eternity? You will have to spend it someplace. Do you know where you'll spend eternity? Christ paid the way. You can be with God. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for what Christ has done. Thank you for the salvation that we can have through Jesus because he has paid our debt. We can be forgiven. We can be reconciled. We can be adopted into the family of God. We can be heirs of the kingdom coming. We can have all of this because of Jesus Christ, but we have to put our faith, our hope of, in, of eternity in him. And Father, there's somebody here today that has never trusted Christ. May today be that day of salvation. Thank you for what Christ has done. We pray in his name. Amen. Let's stand, please.